I have to raise these today. Thank you all for coming to the debut Tuesday general session. As we near the end of this fantastic meeting, attended by 2,300 people, the most ever at a meeting, we have a new opportunity to learn, to be inspired, and to celebrate. The feeling of excitement is palpable as we get ready to recognize excellence in the Academy, hear another dynamic speaker, and then have some fun. Traditionally, Tuesday evening has been a time where we honor many members of the Academy. This includes the talented leaders, past, present, and future of our association, and we will continue that tradition today. I would like to recognize the recipients of the 2015 Award for Excellence in Assessment, which is given annually to outstanding assessment programs for their progress in developing and applying evidence of outcomes as part of ongoing pharmacies, education, evaluation, and improvement. Would our Excellence in Assessment Award recipients please stand as I call your names. Please hold your applause until everyone is standing. Nisia Lemoyne, Tammy Ferry, Michael Brown from Concordia University, Wisconsin School of Pharmacy. Ashley Castleberry, Catherine Neal from the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences, and Cindy Stowe from Sullivan University, College of Pharmacy. Beth Martin, Sarah Kuba, and Michelle Michael Pitterly from the University of Wisconsin Madison School of Pharmacy. Congratulations to all of you. Our members are passionate about excellence in teaching and specifically scholarly teaching. The purpose of the Innovations in Teaching competition is to identify innovative education strategies and assessment methods, and to engage faculty in documenting their scholarly approach to teaching and learning. This year's winners were presented at a special se session on Tuesday morning. I asked them to stand as I call their names. And again, please hold your applause until everyone is standing. Marshall Cates from Samford University McWhorter School of Pharmacy, Philip Empey from the University of Pittsburgh School of Pharmacy, Sharon Wright, Christian Yankee, Carrie Hager, and Jim Beatty from the University of Minnesota College of Pharmacy. Congratulations to you all. AACP recognizes that it, it is imperative to, our, to engage our students in meaningful activities to serve communities as part of their development to a lifetime of service in pharmacy. Each year since 2009, we've recognized four student teams whose work extends, extends the reach of healthcare and pharmacist services to populations that are typically uninsured and very much in need of health services and education. This afternoon, I'm pleased to call representatives of the 2015 Student Community Engaged Service Awards to the stage. Each recognition includes a financial award that aims to expand the, the delivery of the services these students have created to help sustain them for some time to come. Our four teams this year are Cedarville University School of Pharmacy, Chicago State, University College of Pharmacy, Creighton University School of Pharmacy and Health Professions, and Union University School of Pharmacy. I will share a brief synopsis of each team's work while representatives from their schools make their way to the stage. At Cedarville University, the students teaching educational six plans for success or STEPS initiative has allowed interprofessional student teams to provide preventative health counseling 
blood pressure, body mass index, and glu glucose screenings to patients at two homeless shelters. Through this program, students have seen an increase in participants reaching positive health goals, such as reducing cigarette smoking and, ex and increasing exercise. I welcome faculty advisor Ginger Cameron and student leader Juanita Drain from Cedarville to receive the first award. The Promoting Stronger Bones Project, designed by the student Asian, Asian pharmacists, excuse me, at the Chicago State University College of Pharmacy, expanded access to osteoporosis screening for four underserved Asian American and Pacific Islander communities in Chicago. These services equated to approximately $30,000 in overall savings to patients who would otherwise not have access to this type of care. Please welcome Dean Miriam Mobley-Smith, faculty advisor Les Cindy Leslie Roberson, student project leader Bernice Mann, and student, and student Christine Manlimos to the stage to receive their award. I think I slaughtered that name. That's all right. <laughs> Okay. All right. The Creighton University School of Pharmacy and Health Professions was instrumental in developing the Free Portal Clinic, which has allowed interprofessional student teams to counsel more than 2,000 underserved residents in 2014. The clinic and related course focus on many of the Healthy People 2020 leading health indicators related to hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and access to health care and prescriptions. Accepting the award for Creighton University is Dean J. Chris Bradbury, faculty project advisor Anne Ryan Haddad, and student leader Brian Dolkey. Dolke. Did I get it right? I have to tell you that for people who are flying home, you might want to mail this puppy because it's heavy. <laughs> Union University School of Pharmacy's Project Population Health and Rural Medicine, or FARM, evaluated the influence of functional li health literacy on adherence to cholesterol, hypertension, and diabetes medications within an underserved population. In order to measure adherence, students and faculty built medication profiles while performing free heart screenings for underserved patients at various area pharmacies. I now invite Dean Sheila Mitchell Faculty Advisor Sean King, Erica Rogers from the Center for IPW and Farm, Res Farm Research Fellow, and student leader Todd Ellison Todd, and, a st and student Kelsey Turcotte on behalf of Union University to come to the stage and receive the award. Help me congratulate this team, these teams. Excellent. Congratulations. It's now time to celebrate achievement in AACP's journal. I invite AJPE editor, Dr. Gail Brazo, Dean of the University of New England College of Pharmacy to the stage to present the Rufus A. Lyman Award. <laughs> the 
the Rufus A. Lyman Award, named for the first educator of the American Journal of Pharmaceutical Education, recognizes the best paper published during the year. This is the 47th year that we've granted the prestigious Lyman Award. The 2014 paper selected for this honor is, Is a Pharmacy Student the Customer or Product? authored by Dr. David Holford of Virginia Commonwealth University. In his paper, Dr. Holford thoughtfully analyzed whether the customer of our efforts as educators is the student or the patient, concluding that the patient who is ultimately served by the students we educate is the customer. Would Dr. Holford please join me at the podium? So I've written a lot of things over the years, and some things you have to write, and some things you just have to write because they're important. And it's not part of, it's something that comes from um, inside you. And uh, this topic is one of them. Um, since I've received this, uh, since I've uh, published this paper, I've had a lot of good compliments from people. And as a writer, one of the most important compliments you can receive is, I have read this paper and I like it. <laughs> Although there's another um, compliment you receive, just a little bit better, is I've read this paper, I like it, and I've shared it with somebody else. And I've had a lot of people say that. And then the, one of the nicest things you can get in terms of a compliment is, I have read this paper and I'm using it to try to change the way things are at our institution. And I can think of no other compliment or other award that I could possibly get, except for possibly the Lyman Award that would be a little bit better. <laughs> Thank you very much. Finally, I'd like to recognize all the past recipients of the Lyman Award. Thank you for your contributions to AJPE and to pharmacy education. Thank you, Gail. I am delighted to announce a new addition to our cadre of faculty honors, the Distinguished Teaching Scholar Award. This award will recognize outstanding academic pharmacy faculty who are engaged in or supporting scholar, scholarly teaching and the scholarship of teaching and learning. AACP is now accepting letters of intent through September 10th. Please visit the website under career development, then awards for more information. I would now like to recognize those who have served, ha have served with me on the 2014-2015 AACP Board of Directors. And these, the picture of these wonderful people is, is right there. So help me, can you, like, help me thank them. Just an amazing group of people to work with and I, I have to tell you, we do serious work, but we have an awful lot of fun. The annual meeting marks the tr transition in our leadership year when some of our board members end their terms. I would like to recognize these individuals who have served so well. Now completing my second year, I have come to appreciate the level of commitment AACP requires from presidential officers as they serve for three years. We have been very well served by immediate past president Peggy Piazak. Peggy, would you please come forward to accept our traditional memento of a clock of the world an especially appropriate token of appreciation for you, a global leader in pharmacy and healthcare. On a personal note, as Peggy comes up here, I have to tell you 
She told me early on that her, the number one goal of the immediate past president was to make the president look good. And I maintained a little list of everything Peggy did, including, including uh, going under the desk to plug in my power cord. She really did a good job. Thank you, Pat. Uh, to the members of the Academy, I want to thank you for the honor of serving as your president. It's truly been the highest honor of my academic career. And as I exit stage right, I think I will be leaving you in good shape. I'm being replaced on the board by a guy named DePiro. So thank you. Oh boy. Uh, let me see. Oh, I'm right here. AACP has a legacy of strong leadership. Let's now recognize those colleagues who have served the association as president in the past years. I'll read the names of the past presidents attending the meeting and ask them to stand. Please hold your applause until I've identified each of them. Jeff Baldwin, Lyle Bootman, Rod Carter, Jordan Cohn, Brian Crabtree, Jolaine Dragalis, Jean Paul Gagnon, Henry Manassi, Milap Nahada, Peggy Piazak is still standing, I bet, Nick Popovich, Cindy Rail, Vicki Roche, Marilyn Speedy, and Vic Janchek. What a wonderful group of colleagues and leaders. There are a variety of ways to serve AACP. Again this year, we needed volunteers more than ever to serve as room monitors. We are deeply indebted to all of our volunteers during the past several days for helping to make our sessions run smoothly. I ask our volunteers to stand. Don't be shy. And once again, thank you to our sponsors who, for helping to make this event possible. Let's give them a round of applause. As we approach the end of this meeting, uh, the end of my presidential year and my tenure as a dean, I thought I'd tell you a fairy tale about a pharmacy director who decided to become a dean. Once upon a time, well in 1989, I was the director of pharmacy at the University of Colorado Hospital and I was an assistant professor in the School of Pharmacy. We were just developing our PharmD program, and I went to Dean Diamond, Lou Diamond, and I told him, Lou, I'm not going to hire any more CU students, graduates. Well, you can imagine what the dean said. I was, he wasn't very happy with me. I explained that it took several years to get BS students up to speed at, for a tertiary care hospital. I remember when Lou was, when he became so mad, I remember him saying, you can't do that. You're the largest hospital in the state. He said, you have to take our students. <sighs> so Lou's remedy, you're gonna love this one, was to put me on every PharmD planning committee in the college, every single one. At that point, I decided that if I was going to help the profession that I loved, I was going to have to go upstream to where those little baby pharmacists were spawning. And I decided I had to be a dean. The first thing I did, however, I knew I had to have a PhD degree, so I started a program at the University of Colorado. And I graduated on a sunny Mother's Day in 1995. At that time, when I started my PhD, I started attending AACP meetings. 
and I studied great leaders. I figured if you want to be, try to learn to be a dean, you study the really, really good ones and just watch what they do. So I started watching them. Marianne Cotter Kimball, my dear, dear mentor, Jordan Cohn, he helped me with so many, so much of my leadership uh, learning. And Carl Trenka, just to name a few. AACP provided the bridge between my two career paths. It was a home, and I have been privileged to meet hundreds, if not thousands, of amazing colleagues and friends. Being president of AACP has been an experience and a life of a lifetime, and certainly not one I would have ever dreamt that I'd, I'd experience. I want to thank you all, my colleagues in AACP, for always being so caring and understanding. Thank you for your wonderful ideas and contributions to the profession we love, and thank you for the hugs. Thanks to the amazing AACP staff. You work so hard that oftentimes it seems as though we have double the number of staff, when in reality, it's just a very small team working 150% of the time. Lucinda Main has been an amazing colleague and leader. Many thanks for helping me through my presidency and as a friend in some difficult times. To my faculty and staff from WVU, you are absolutely awesome, and I couldn't have done it without your support and pitching in when I needed extra help. To my students, I will always love you. To my alumni, especially one of my best friends, Tom Menigan, you were warm, you're caring, and you've given so much support to me and to Jim. And we've enjoyed so many wonderful football games and cheering on the Mountaineers. Love to my bunny man, my husband, Jim, for 45 years. You have been the best part of this fairy tale. Sorry. Jim and I are privileged to have had three amazing children. Our oldest daughter, Julie, was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in August of 2011. Four months later, right before her death, she said, Mom, it's okay. I have had an amazing life. I've had quality, but I'm just not going to have quantity. AACP is the same. It can't give you quantity of life, but it will make a difference in the quality of your life. I guarantee it. I guarantee that it will help you realize your fairy tale too. Thank to you. Thanks to you all. Oh. I'm sorry. Oh. Thank you. I knew I'd have trouble getting through that, you guys. I'd now like to introduce a good friend and colleague, an incoming AACP board member, Natalie Eddington, Dean of the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy, who will introduce our featured speaker, and I can hardly wait to hear Freeman Rabowski, President of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Natalie, it's all yours. Good afternoon. As Pat said, I'm Natalie Eddington, the Dean of the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. I'm honored to be in front of you this afternoon to introduce a colleague and a friend, Dr. Freeman A. Rabowski, the President of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Dr. Rabowski was born in Birmingham, Alabama. He was a child of the Civil Rights Movement, and at the age of 12, he spent five days in jail for joining a peaceful protest. Those days framed the rest of his life. Dr. Rabowski graduated from Hampton Institute with honors in mathematics. He received his PhD in higher education administration and statistics from the University of Illinois at Urbana. 
He became president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County in 1992 at the age of 42. His accolades and his achievements are those that represent many lifetimes. Some of those include named to chair the President's Advisory Commission on Education Excellence for African Americans by President Obama. In 2008, Dr. Hrabowski was named one of America's best leaders by U.S. News and World Report. U.S. News and World Report has ranked UMBC, his university, the nation's number one up and coming institution for many years. In 2009, Time Magazine named Dr. Rabowski one of America's best college presidents. In 2012, Time Magazine named him one of the 100 most influential people in the world. He holds honorary degrees from more than 20 institutions, including Harvard, Princeton, Duke, and Johns Hopkins. He co-founded the Meyerhoff Program. This is the most successful program in the United States for graduating underrepresented students in the areas of science and engineering. On a personal note, the first time I met Freeman, he took me on a walking tour of his campus. What struck me is that with all of his success and all of his achievements, he has not lost touch, and his true calling is his connection to students. He is a friend and mentor to me in my leadership endeavors, and it gives me the time, which is a gift that he doesn't have much time for. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Freeman Rabowski to the stage. <laughs> Thank you, Natalie. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Thank you, Natalie, very much. William Carlos Williams once said that it's difficult to find news in poetry, and yet men die miserably every day because of a lack of what is found there. And so I begin with poetry. It was our beloved and now late Mara Angelou who once said to this nation at the installation of another president, lift up your eyes upon this day breaking for you. Give birth again to the dream. Women, children, men, take it, this dream, into the palms of your hands, mold it into the image of your most public self, sculpt it into the shape of your most private need. Here on the pulse of this new day, you may have the grace to look up and out and into your sister's eyes and into your brother's face and say simply, very simply with hope, good morning. And say, I say to you, good afternoon, y'all, good afternoon. Give her a hand for poetry, for poetry. Give her a round of applause for poetry. I spent the morning in Northern Virginia um, at an international conference of mathematics. And the title of the conference was Opening Our Mathematics Eyes. This term, mathematics eyes, the Europeans call it math's eyes, M-A-T-H-S. They use that term, M-A-T-H-S. And it was the Irish who, who started this term, Terry McGuire, and we're gonna hear more of it in Europe, uh, from Europe a lot. And it has to do with the fact that we use math all the time uh, and the math that we tend to use, we don't consider real math. The real math we tend to think of as the math we cannot do. <laughs> the math that we use every day, we don't think of as math. And, and um, the Europeans, in many ways, are a bit ahead of us in that they are trying to figure out how to catch up with people in some of the Asian countries, since the Europeans and we tend to be in that bottom half according to the most recent international competitions, the PISA exams, the international, the, um, uh, international math and science competitions, and they are trying to change attitudes. And I bring it up because you are looking at ways of broadening the groups that are involved in uh, the pharmacy discipline, in the pharmacy career, and I want to challenge you for a few minutes this morning, this afternoon, by thinking about dreams and about what we might do. 
Each of us is the product of our childhood experiences. I am from a university that has students from 150 countries. The people this morning were from many countries, from Europe and from Asian countries, from African countries, uh, and from America, and they were mathematicians, uh, but they were also people from outside of mathematics. It was on adult learning of mathematics and changing attitudes in different countries. And we in America are trying to figure out how we can get more people to like math. Now, this is an interesting group. I have to test this group, and I want you to tell me the truth. Now, get ready to tell me the truth. First of all, how many of you love to read? Let me see your hands. Okay, now, how many of you love mathematics? Let me see your hands. It's a pretty nerdy group, I'm impressed, I really am. Mine is a campus, Natalie knows this, it's very nerdy. Uh, I like telling people we are usually the national chess champions. Give me a big hand for that, we're the national chess champions. And uh, my campus is one where the basketball team reads well, give us a hand for that. And they get good jobs, all right? And, then, uh, and now, here's the point, here's the point. Um, how many of you actually could say you're really good in mathematics? Let me see your hands. How many of you are ready for a math test right now? Let me see your hands. Ah, very interesting. How many of you are ready to make a math bet with me right now? Ah, oh, how many of you are ready to make a bet for $1,000? Ah, oh, this is very interesting, Natalie. We're going to see. We'll, we'll come back to that. But I bring that up for this reason. As we think about preparation of people in pharmacy, as you know, at the base of pharmacy, one has to do some science. And as a mathematician, I will say, you've got to have some math to do some chemistry. Am I right? There is, and one has to be able to read in order to do word problems. I often tell students, having had the opportunity to work on preparing and some tests, some, some questions, that when you talk about standardized tests, whether you're talking about the SAT or as you move up the line, you talk about word problems. And we don't, and we would say this in math, you don't express math or word problems in numbers. You express word problems in language. Am I right? Well, they're talking about in pharmacy, in medicine, in nursing, in whatever the discipline, you have to be able to express yourself in language, and then you translate into equations, you look at the relationships among the words, and you go from there. And so, as I talk, I want you to think about what it takes to prepare any student, regardless of race or gender. And I want you to think about this notion of the broader question of how we prepare pharmacists, and then the question of how we can broaden the pipeline to include people from different kinds of backgrounds, people from disadvantaged backgrounds, people of color, people who are first generation college, and others. I often tell a part of the story that Natalie tells. I grew up in the Deep South. My campus, UMBC, is in Baltimore. I like to say that Baltimore is the Upper South, the Upper South. One day we think like people in Philadelphia, the next day like people in Richmond. It depends on the issue, all right? But in, Bal in Birmingham, it's the Deep South, and we love stories. And the story is that I was sitting in the back of church, and I tell this in my book, and, and all of a sudden, the man said, and if the children participate in this peaceful protest, all of America will know that the kids want a better education. They're tired of these second-handed books, and, and they really will do whatever it takes to get that better education. I go home, and I say, I want this better education. And somehow, my parents tell me, no, you can't go to jail. And I tell them, you are hypocrites. At that time, you did not tell your parents they were hypocrites. They send me to my room. The next day, after praying all night, they allow me to go. I do spend the week in jail. And it taught me this, that even children can be empowered to believe they can make a difference in their own lives. And they can be taught what Thoreau said, that civil disobedience makes a difference, that if something is unjust, that a person in this country has the right to say we want a better world. And the man who talked to the children was Dr. King. And the lesson he taught me is the point I want to make to you. And it is this, that the world of tomorrow can be better than the world of today. That even though things may be one way this day, they don't have to be the same tomorrow. Let me make that point. We had that civil rights movement. We had the legislation. We had, amazingly, the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, the Higher Education Act, and the world changed dramatically. 
Think about it for a minute. What percent of Americans do you think in the 60s had a college education? What would you think? Let me hear now. Don't let me say that the pharmacists are risk adverse, please. I hear 40. What else? 30. I hear 20. Anybody else? Only 10% of Americans had a college education in the early 60s. Only 10%. It was broken down into two races. At that time, everything was black and white, right? We were not breaking it down into other groups. In fact, when I talk to young people, I tell them, believe it or not, there was no color TV. How many of you remember before the time of color TV? I hate to tell you, you're older than you think you are, all right? <laughs> because your students and your kids will tell you, what do you mean? TV's always been in color, right? No, it was not. It was black and white, am I right? With three stations at most, right? All right, for the young people in the room, there were only three stations. Here's the point that 10% and it was only 3% black and about 11% white. What percent today have a college degree? I heard 30. Anybody else? What did you say? 48. Anybody else? We're finally up to 30% with college degrees. What percent of whites? Come on now, now, don't be risk adverse. 60, anybody else? It's actually about 38%. What percent of blacks? It's not quite 20%. What's the fastest growing group in our country? Hispanic, up to about 15%. What's the, what is the highest achieving group in our country? Asian, what percent? I normally get a 90 from somebody. But it is 55%, 25% of my students are of Asian descent, actually. The fact is, it is 55% because a lot of people come from other countries that go to grad school here, right? And their kids are here, but it is 55%, okay? Native Americans are below the 15% even, okay? Put it together, it's about a third. What am I telling you? I'm telling you that even today, only a third of Americans in total have a college degree over age 25. Okay? Now, my friends of all races will say, Freeman, that couldn't be true. Everybody I know has a college degree. Duh. <laughs> Duh. Pharmacy deans, no pharmacy deans. And faculty, no faculty. And lawyers, no lawyers. And nurses, no lawyers. And plumbers who make more money than any of y'all, no plumbers. <laughs> Give the plumbers a round of applause. All right. <laughs> My point is that most Americans do not have a college degree. And now here, so we've made a lot of progress. We have tripled the number of people with college degrees. You as educated people need to know that. But this is the most important point to me. The bottom quarter of Americans of all races in the 60s had almost no chance of going to college and making it. Literally under 10% would go to college and graduate. And today, it's still under 10%. Did you get that? So that's one of our challenges, that the bottom 25% for any race still have very little chance. And that's one of the challenges in America. We are not helping that group of any race to move up. Number two, that we still have issues with students of color, children of color in general. So first generation college students we need to work on and people of color. Now, how many of you in this room are either the first in your family or first generation college to go to, to, go to college? Look around the room. It's a wonderful story. That, and one of my messages today is to tell your story. Because people need to know, young people need to know that many of the faculty were first in their family to go to college. That is an inspiring story because it can tell young people who were the first that, yes, Others have been the first, and they can make it. Now, that's the broad question, the broad point. The second point, though, is we have the issue of STEM, of science, technology, engineering, and math. And as you know, we in America are known to be a country that has not increased substantially the numbers who are succeeding in STEM areas. Let me put it in perspective. I chaired the National Academies Committee on underrepresentation in STEM several years ago. It did not surprise the group coming from Harvard and MIT to Howard to U Texas, El Paso, people from all kinds of institutions to Miami Dade Community College. Didn't surprise us that only 20% of blacks and Hispanics who begin with a major in science and engineering actually graduated with a major in science and engineering. But what percent of whites do you think 
who begin with a major in science actually graduate with a bachelor's in science? What do you think? Take a guess. I heard 40%. Anybody else? 20? Anybody else? It's only 32%. Only 32%. What percent of Asian Americans? It's only 40%. Now, let me tell you the stunning fact. And listen carefully, because this is counterintuitive. The higher the SATs or ACTs, the more prestigious the university, the larger the number of AP credits, the greater the probability the student who starts in science will leave it within the first year or two. Did you get that? The higher the test scores, the more prestigious the university. If you know somebody and they go off saying, I'm going to be this physician or this whatever, and they come back, my line is this, and this has always obsessed people when I say it. I say it for the shock effect. They go off to be doctors, they come back as great lawyers. <laughs> right? Why do I say that? For this reason. Anything that's quantitative based, quantitatively based, pharmacy, chemistry, physics, engineering, will have that math component. Anything that's quantitatively based has an unpredictability factor. Because if I give you five problems and three of them you've seen and two you've not seen before, I change them around, you get on that test and you're frightened. And you go, oh my goodness, I haven't seen this before. And before you know it, you don't do as well. If it's totally social science based and you work hard and you can read and write, you are quite possibly going to get at least a B. You get my point? There's more of a certainty factor if you work hard. But you know this, in a science-based curriculum, if it's quantitative, there is a factor of unpredictability that leads people to get pushed away. And what happens in America is that literally only 5% of 25-year-olds have degrees in STEM compared to 11% in other countries, in Europe. In Europe, not even getting to the fact that India is creating 800 additional universities. Now, take that and add to it the fact that when you get to the underrepresented groups, you're down to 2 and 3% actually making it. Now you get to your profession where you're saying you want to broaden the numbers in your profession. What I would say is this. What we work to do on my campus, as an example, is to redesign the first two years of science and engineering. And what I'm talking about is getting away from the lecture model. We would say that the lecture model is 20th century, that students today are, how many of you know that many students in undergrad school are bored? Are bored, quite for, in high school and college, that they're sitting there. The, the president of Stanford spoke to all the presidents this past fall, and he asked the presidents this question. How long do you think the average college student listens <laughs> listens to the average lecture. What do you think? <laughs> it's about eight minutes. One of the reasons I keep asking you questions is that I know you're thinking about that wine for the reception, right? <laughs> and she's keeping me, how much time do I have? She's keeping me to this half hour, wait a minute. And so what I'm trying to do, what I'm doing is I'm not just talking to you, I'm pulling you in by asking you questions because if I only talk at you, you're going to be thinking about that, that reception next. You get my point? If you look at the Chemistry Discovery Center at UMBC, you will see we have broken it down into groups of four. We use the biotech companies on campus. We don't give students the theories. They have to figure out the theories. They hate it the first part of the semester. They will, and the first thing they will say is this, we don't want to be in here because we don't want to work with anybody. Because in high school, students who are high achievers will tell you, I don't need anybody. Because they are taught in high school that if you work with somebody else, you are cheating. You get that? And so unlike what happens in real work, where people work to collaborate, and to solve problems together, up until college, they are taught you work alone in your room with your music on by yourself. And so one of our challenges, and one of the things I would suggest to you, is that the more you can get involved in high school and college education, in working, first of all, to give high school teachers and in undergrad programs examples from your profession, 
to use, examples that will bring the science and the math to life. The more you can show quantitative examples that will bring the math and the science to life in examples from pharmacy, quite frankly, the more you can excite students about the work. Secondly, what we work to do, and my dream was always to figure out how to get students more excited about math and science and to bring more black kids and Hispanic kids and students in general into the work. And so what I learned in the civil rights movement was the value of community. The idea of pulling students together and having them learning not to be cutthroat, which is what happens in science so often, but to work together to collaborate and work with each other. When I was in an NSF program at Tuskegee as a child, the professor came in and put a problem on the board, and he said, when you can solve this problem, come and see me. And all the kids got really upset. They said, he's not a good teacher because he won't give us the answer. And I said, who is that guy? I thought he was Superman or something. And they said his name is Dr. So-and-so. And amazingly, they said he's got a PhD. I said, what's a PhD? They said, that's the highest degree you can get. I said, I'm going to get a PhD. And I, I had this little fat face, and I love to eat and do math, all right? <laughs> and so every day, I'd look in the mirror at age 13, and I'd say, good morning, Dr. Rabowski. You know, and I saw myself exciting kids for math, right? And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to excite kids about math. The idea is how do you give kids a vision of what they want to do? And I would suggest to you that you want to get kids excited about the possibility. Let them think about the possibility of being a pharmacist. To have groups of kids in college in the pharmacy clubs, but, but the two things they need is the vision of the possibility, and secondly, and most of, this is where the rigor comes, working with them to get solid backgrounds in the science and thinking skills in that first year or two of that college experience. Because if we can have more students having that strong background in the chemistry, the math and the chemistry and the reading, they can do anything. And if they know the possibilities, it's the rigor of analysis that can make all the difference. I would argue that one of the problems with diversity in our country is that it's been more warm and fuzzy. When I talk to deans of engineering, deans of nursing, deans of medicine, and every one of the STEM areas, we need to bring more rigor of analysis into the work. It takes the, the professionals to pull the professionals into the work. If we could have every professional taking on the responsibility of helping to build communities among students and to have these programs where there is a sense of pride among those students, it could make all the difference in the world. You know, I have found that having sets of problems that students work on and get excited about can make all the difference in the world. I've worked with kids in other countries and looked at the apprenticeship programs in Germany, for example, in Stuttgart. Do you know that the children not going to universities who work in the apprenticeship programs in chemistry actually do better in chemistry than our AP kids in chemistry? Because they're working on real life problems in the companies as a way of life. My students who work at the National Institutes of Health in the 10th and 11th grade, my students who work in math problems on cybersecurity who get into real life problems are fascinated by math and computer science and cybersecurity because they're working on real life problems and they get to understand how they connect to life. And more of that is what we need. And you are the practitioners. You can bring that to life if you show somebody that you are a nice person and you show them how cool it is to be nice while how cool it is to love doing the work. You'd be amazed at what can happen. You know, I want you to think about two final points. I was so impressed with your outgoing president as she talked about quality and quantity. My mother had been a little child maid in a little country town and learned to read in a home of a wealthy white woman who would talk about books with her. And mother ended up being an English teacher. And then when the new math came, she became a math teacher too. And I was her guinea pig of reading and math. And at the end of my mother's life, mother had developed dementia. And my wife had convinced her to come and live with us 
in, in, Birmingham, in Baltimore to move from Birmingham and she didn't want to leave her church and she had been hiding the fact that she had dementia but we finally figured it out. And one day she said to me, I know the end is near. And she didn't even know who I was and I was, I was an only child. And she looked at me and she knew I was familiar but she wasn't sure quite who I was but she said, I know the end is near and, and you never want to hear your mother say that. And I said, what's important to you? And she looked at me with the sweetest smile and she said, what's important? She said, relationships, relationships. And I was trying to hold it together and she said, my relationship with my God, she said, you just hold on to your faith, what you'd always told me, you'll be okay. And then she said, my relationship with my husband, he's a wonderful man. She forgot my dad had died 20 years before. Then she shocked me. Remember I said I was an only child. She said, my relationship uh, with my son, he's a wonderful person. Now, I'm thinking she's telling me she had a kid when she was a teenager or something. And I'm getting very angry, very angry, right? I'm thinking, TMI, too much information, right? If I haven't had a brother at this point, I don't want a brother. And she said, he's a college president. Look at me right in my face, right? She just didn't know who I was, right? Uh, and then she gave me the real gift. And I give this gift to you because it is the essence of life itself. She said, you know, but I now understand that teachers touch eternity through their students. My relationship with my students, that is the essence of who I have been. That whatever I had to give, I gave it to my children, to my students and I will live through those young people. I went back to Birmingham, and all these young people, some had become math teachers, some had become English teachers, they said, your mama taught me to love math, your mama taught me to love reading, and she helped me get out of the projects and to get my mama and grandma out of the projects, and we will live through your mama's love. I say to all of you, show your leadership and your belief in humanity through what you do for not only the students you have today, but your belief in the young people who could one day be just like you. I challenge you to watch your thoughts, they become your words. Watch your words, they become your actions. Watch your actions, they become your habits. Watch your habits, they become your character. I tell my students, your character has everything to do with who you are, not only when people can see you, but as I say to my students, who are you when you don't think anybody's watching? Thoughts become words, words become actions, actions become habits, habits become character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny, dreams and values. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lebowski. Um, I'm pleased that one of my daughters is an alumna of, of your university. Um, whew, I have to take a breath here a minute. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone that there are several excellent uh, education sessions tomorrow and uh, breakfast at 7. We'll have the House of Delegates at 10 and, of course, delegates sign in at 7 tomorrow morning. I think the 116th annual convention has really been dynamic and a particular pleasure to welcome our Canadian colleagues as we really explore and advance uh, global education. I'm excited about next year's meeting. We are going to beautiful Anaheim, California for the 2016 AACP annual meeting a little bit later in July 23rd through 27th at Anaheim Marriott, uh, not a Gaylord, Anaheim Marriott and Anaheim Convention Center. But before we move on, you'll be seeing the CE code on the screen uh, for your continuing education. You might make a note of that. All right, and now for a special treat. As you all know, our nation's capital is just a few miles away, and it's a site of so much history and also history in the making. 
Um, maybe that isn't always a clean process, and it's certainly interesting and in the news every single day. Uh, we have asked Washington's own capital steps to help us navigate the ups and downs of government and the politicians who populate this town. So please don't move. We'll do a quick set change and then get ready for the capital steps. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? If you're a candidate for president in 16, raise your hand, just raise your hand. Now listen, if you will, because there's some people from the Hill, and they seem to think they're qualified to run this land. Now you may have heard of Hillary, Bush, Biden, Christie, sure, but all of them together are nothing compared to the electric thrill you will get when Ted Cruz, Bernie Sanders, Martin O'Malley, and Marco Rubio all come to Iowa on the very same historic day. 76 unknowns are the candidates with 110 more set to declare. In Des Moines every week in Des Moines they're lined up like rows of corn and most just do not have a prayer. 76 unknowns on the campaign trail and most of them think that they will be great. We're following Lindsey Graham, but we think that it's a scam every time he tells us that he's straight. New Hampshire will be crawling with these candidates. Posters watch Dixville notch like it's the next big thing. Celebrities can run and one has made the jump. Now Donald Trump threw his hair in the ring. It seems that every time they're starting earlier, jump the gun, gun. Clinton Bush would sure be green, environmentally it would mean we'd reuse our props from 92. 76 unknowns will campaign for months, but most of these candidates really stink. They're not doing us any good, so we wish Bill Cosby would take them all out for a drink. And now, please welcome the President of the United States, Barack Obama. Hello. I'm Barack Obama, and I'm here tonight to speak directly to you, the American people. Thank you. And now, first, uh, First, I would like to uh, mention the landmark decision of the Supreme Court uh, regarding gay marriage. I would also like to congratulate uh, two friends of mine who can finally get married, uh, Bert and Ernie. Uh, recently, I made executive action that will keep nearly five million illegal immigrants from being deported. Uh, what Americans need to understand is that these immigrants will do what most Americans won't, like voting for Democrats. <laughs> uh, now, uh, you may have heard that uh, Donald Trump is running for president. <laughs> <laughs> and now, here's a man who consistently called for the surfacing of my uh, birth certificate. Uh, so now, I am calling for the birth certificate of whatever that is living on his head. Uh, the GOP told me uh, that one of the points on their uh, agenda is to cut funding for those who refuse to do meaningful work for it. I can't believe they're going to cut congressional salaries. <laughs> and you may have heard that uh, somebody hopped over the fence in front of the White House. Yeah, but there's no real reason to be alarmed. That person was just an avid supporter of my wife Michelle's Get Moving campaign. And now, if you watch uh, my State of the Union, you will have noticed that one of the themes that I had was creating jobs. And of course, part of the key to creating jobs is starting small businesses. Now, some people might ask me, uh, Mr. President, how do you start a small business in this economy? Well, here's your answer. You start a big business, then you wait. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> problem solved. Uh, I also made mention of sending Secretary of State John Kerry uh, over to deal with potential terrorist organizations. I selected John Kerry because, as you know, I believe in the expanded use of drones. That actually went better than I thought that it would here. Uh, there are some people in the GOP who uh, consider uh, the midterm elections as a mandate. There are those who reject the idea of a mandate. And there are those out there who believe that uh, mandates lead to gay marriage. <laughs> it's like the understanding starts here and then migrates all the way over here. <laughs> well, good for you. And now, I'd like to take some time to talk about uh, the turmoil in the Middle East. Now, of course, when it comes to Syria, we're still weighing our options. Uh, but when it comes to the people of Syria, we understand that they face an uncertain future. Because even if they're able to oust Syrian President Bashar al-Assad, there's still the danger that he might simply be replaced by his brother, Jeb al-Assad. This time, y'all beat them to the punch. All right. Uh, now, in conclusion, uh, some people have accused me of being uh, weak uh, on Ukraine. But there's one thing I know. If Russians don't retreat, I can't defeat them. Well, I look weak if all I do is try to tweet them. Pipes keep falling to the Reds, but that doesn't mean my foreign policy is dead. Crimea is not for me, and I'm never gonna stop McCain from complaining. And so I did my attempts at talking smack. I said, hey, the 80s called, they want their Cold War back, but nothing works for me. I Sound like James Taylor versus Vlad the Impaler. Remember long ago when Reagan made his call to tear this wall down. If it were me, they wouldn't have to tear it all down. Just a trim. Crane parts keep falling to the reds. Let's hope that the Soviet reunion doesn't spread. They voted to secede. And here are the choices that were there on the ballot. And so you see, it's democracy. That's what's worrying me. Thank you all very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am German Chancellor Angela Merkel. And uh, we have a situation in Europe, it seems uh, that the Germans were the only ones not spending too much money. While other countries were out shopping, we were back home practicing our marching. And now they have asked us to bail out all of Europe, which would really annoy us if we did not have such good sense of humor. <laughs> so now, we have developed a new musical, Grease. Get your tickets now, only 12 billion euros. Starting the Greek Prime Minister of the Week, George Skabalaka Kavaloni. And the French President, Francois Hollande. <laughs> and I, Angela Merkel. Hit it! Both the Greeks said they should run their lives, but you cannot retire when you are 25. We're all in danger, we should make a deal. It's quite ironic that Greece is the squeaky wheel. Greece is the worst. Greece is the worst, is the worst, is the worst. Now the Euro is in trouble and they're trying to blame the Greeks. Keep talking, oh, keep talking. An economic bubble. 
double because we work 10 hour weeks. You keep the money, you bet we'll keep the money. We'll send gifts to show remorse. Not another Trojan horse. There's another way to go. Charge a grand for each gyro. Grease is frightening. Go, 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 go. Oh, Grease is frightening. You're wondering what the Greeks are doing. Grease frightening, oh, Grease is frightening. Oh, Grease is frightening. We've always had a thing for ruins. Grease frightening, oh, Grease is frightening. Uh, a real Achilles heel. Greece is frightening. My heart is saying, fool, forget them. As head of state, I should let go. I'd be rude to them. That's just what I intend to do. Summer days looking so lean. Spending days a bee on their means. We just don't know what to do. I'd surrender if I were you. There's, There's no, no doubt, doubt that we should not bail you out, out but oh, maybe China, China might. Well, well, well. <laughs> tell me more, tell me more. Here's the best thing to do. Tell me more, tell me more. How about talking to who? The Chinese guy. Who? Right. China could save us for sure. But in an hour, you'd be hungry for more. China could give Greece a start. They could build a great wall apart. Someone sane would not save us again. But. Oh. Maybe China. I'm Russian President Vladimir Putin, here to welcome myself. As you know, I've been major pain in the Tokas in the Ukraine. Many people are upset with me. I do not know why. We went to visit another Eastern European country the other day. They asked my name. I said, Vladimir Putin. I said, country of origin. I said, Russia. They said, occupation. I said, no, no, just visiting. <laughs> See, I'm a fun guy. <clears throat> now, other world leaders are also upset with me, including your Secretary of State, John Kerry. He's so upset, he wanted to meet with me in Ukraine. Unfortunately, I could not make this meeting as I got snowed in. Uh, I'll have that joke writer exiled. Now, I still have no idea what your President Obama intends to do about any of this. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Selfie. Oh. <laughs> what the hell is that? Anyway, I know that your president is very fond of song and dance, so as a gesture to him, I would like to do a Russian song by me, Vladimir Putin. My name's Vlad, when I get mad, and when there's pain, like in Ukraine, I send more sheep. A Putin on the blitz. My always power, you may assert, don't make me take off my shirt. Say tisk tisk. Ooh, Putin is a risk. Though US sends threats, I just don't see ya. Uh, 
coming all the way to help cry me ya. I wouldn't want to be ya. And their plan to stop this threat makes me jump up and say, yeah, just like the Brits, we give a baba fits. Oh, we are matching wits. Our Putin never quits. I'm Putin on the blitz. Da. Eh, spasiba, spasiba. I am TV celebrity and mega wealthy real estate mogul and your next president of the United States, Donald Trump. Now, before I say words, I have to address the recent controversy, my remarks about the evil Mexicans. To be clear, to be clear, not all Mexicans are bad. Some are Okay. Like the ones who mow my hair. But enough about Mexicans. Let's talk about me. I'm going to be the next president. My, my campaign is going to be the grandest, biggest thing ever in my own mind. Now, there are rumors, there were rumors that I am responsible for uh, paying people to attend my campaign announcement, paying them $50 each. See? I'm not even in office and I've already created jobs. <laughs> now, I'll keep this shorter than my announcement. Uh, I want to give you three main reasons why I should be your next president. Number one, hottest first lady ever. No? Okay. Two, I will put casinos in all government buildings. I'd put slot machines in the U.S. Capitol building, but it's already full of craps. <laughs> huh? You're gonna vote for me now, aren't you? Number three, I may not be able, I may not be able to eliminate the national debt, but I'll at least comb it over. <laughs> and number four, yeah, I know I said three, but I do everything bigger and better and grander. So number four, I will change the name of the presidential aircraft to Hair Farce One. So vote for me, Donald Trump, or you're fired. As you know, uh, we Democrats uh, got shellacked in the midterm election. Uh, so my party is uh, forced to take a nice, long, hard look at itself. Uh, so to help me uh, brainstorm to keep the GOP and beating us in future select, uh, elections, I've invited tonight uh, Nancy Pelosi. and uh, Vice President Joe Biden. <laughs> uh, not, not now, Joe. <laughs> now, uh, let's just get straight to it. Uh, Nancy. Joe. Uh, something or someone associated with the Democrats is unpopular amongst voters. <laughs> now, I think that if we can find it, we can fix it. After all, we make a great team. I provide executive experience. And I have the legislative knowledge. I am also here. 
Uh, Mr. President, it is obvious we are not playing to our base voters. That's right. We can't afford to move to the middle. We have to support our base. Not playing to our base? I can assure you that is not true. Because you know I'm all about that bass, about that bass, so liberal. I'll energize the bass, plead our case, no trouble. I pander to the bass with this face so simple. We're all about the bass, about that bass. Yeah, it's pretty clear. I know this duck is lame, but I can't take it, take it. When folks say I'm the blame, cause I brought that doom bloom to all the blue states. Oh, how we stunk in all the big races. I see the vote trends, we're gonna make it stop. Attack the 1% to get us back on top. If you are poor and needy, we'll build you up and redistribute you as well to the bottom from the top. Yeah, Obama, he told us we're just in a tiny slot. Shoo up, up, shoo up, up. Now we're led by the elephant as we stare at their rump. That booty, booty, oh, uh, that booty. Yeah, we'll legalize pot till illegal to come along. Shoo up, up, shoo up. I don't care what you guys do, in two years I'll be long gone. Because you know I'm all about that bass, about that bass, don't panic. We're all about the bass that embrace organic. We're all about the bass as we chase Hispanics. We all gotta say bass with that bass. and a lot of you want to know if I know anything about the uh, the Hillary email scandal blah 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 and I'll tell you the truth I don't know I don't even have Hillary's email address I never asked her for it because I was too afraid she'd ask me for mine. <laughs> uh, you know, it is possible that she uh, answers those questions in her book. I, I didn't read it. She, you know, she spent a good portion of last year on a, uh, a promotional tour uh, going all over the world telling people about the book. And this tour took her very far, far away from me. And well, for a while now, she's been back home, and I don't, I don't think there's anyone sorrier than I am. <laughs> but that's why I'm glad she's running for president, because she'll once again be on the road and far, far away from me. <laughs> you know, Hillary, she's always been there for me, right there, right by my side. When I was dealing with the draft, Hillary was right there. When I was dealing with scandals as governor and as president, Hillary, right there. When I was having heart surgery, Hillary, once again, right by my side. And you know what I've learned from that? Hillary is really bad luck. <laughs> well, here she is now. Your next president of the United States, Hillary Rodham Clinton. My pose looked great in 2016, not a rival to be seen. I'm getting the nomination. I'll be president and queen. Oh God, here's Biden here to spoil all my fun. Can I keep him out? Is he going to run? I'm getting in, you're gonna see. 
I've wowed Obama as VP with all the hours I did log. Walking his dog. Get out, Joe. Get out, Joe. Just a walk away at midnight. Get out, Joe. Get out, Joe. Or I'll freeze you like a block of ice. Well, I Chances in gray. The facts never bother me anyway. I will get you a great job if you just leave me alone. Hey, you could be a secretary. Of state? Nope, the kind that answers phones. It's time to see what I can do to test the limits and break through. No right, no wrong, no bleeping me. I'm free. Let it go, let it go. I can beat the Republican. Let it go, let it go. I am the better man. I'll run so hard, your head will spin. What's a secret plan? With Bill as my first lady, I will win. Oh. And now, a word from New Jersey Governor Chris Christie. Hey, how y'all doing? All right, now look, I know there's been a whole bunch of whoop de doo and fall de roll and what have you in the news about me a lot lately. Forget about it, all right? You know, the fact of the matter is a law firm hired by me to investigate me has exonerated me. So I got nothing to worry about. But you know, still people ask me, you know, Governor, is this scandal thing gonna impact your presidential campaign? I don't know. I figure I'll close that bridge when I come to it. <laughs> but I think I make a pretty good president. You know why? Because I wouldn't take no guff from anybody, right? You imagine some foreign leaders all up in my face? No way. I don't stand for that. I mean, picture like, uh, like Queen Elizabeth of England is all up in my grill. <laughs> yeah, here's how I'd handle that. London Bridge is shutting down. Shutting down. Shutting down. London Bridge is shutting down. <laughs> Traffic study. Like I once did in Fort Lee, in Fort Lee. Did you see? The roads were like my arteries. <laughs> Clogged and nasty. But if commuters start to whine, just cause I'm shown some spine, they can read between the lines. Hey. It's New Jersey. I got a movie coming out, Fat and Furious. Check it out. I'll see you later. We now take you deep behind the scenes for a closer look at the Supreme Court. Ladies' bathroom. Hello, Sonia. Oh, hi, Ruth. Is there a line? Of course there's a line. Oh, well, that must be Kagan in there, huh? You think? You know, I used to be the only woman in here before you two came along. Back then, I was the hottest woman on the Supreme Court. Back then, I had a chance. <laughs> you? Had a chance with who? Oh, don't pretend you've never thought of him. Who's the conservative justice we can't resist? Scalia, 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 Scalia. Who's the centerfold for strict constructionists? Scalia, 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 Scalia,
That's right, I'm back. And now it's been a tough time in Iraq. So I want to bring out a very a special consultant who has a lot of experience in that area. So please welcome uh, former President George W. Bush. So I heard about that Supreme Court thing. That's good news, right? The, for the gays and the, the lesbians and the BLT. <laughs> Don't look at me like that. What's wrong with you? There's all kinds of things. I'm hearing things like you're invading Texas and, and you bombed Syria. <laughs> what do you have against that little voice in everybody's iPhones? <laughs> you just need to calm down, okay? I know it's tough. I've been there, <laughs> and these are tough times. There are these are these are tough times, these are perilous times, these are dangerous times. One might say these are uncertain times, and you got to remember that uncertain times call for uncertain leadership. <laughs> foreign plans have started a fight when i heard that you had bombed isis lands i wondered why you declared war on iceland the hunters to the left of me mocking from the right here i am stuck in the middle east too yes you stepped in some middle east poo even israel is fed up with you the mid-east is getting beyond repair I always thought the Mideast meant Delaware. People are doubting me. Will he do what's right? All my plans, like I don't know what to do. Well, I went to up in Laden, and I thought that things were going great. Yeah, but what have you done for us lately? Can we stop this whole ISIS mess before the next election day? Please. My daddy would say, not got that. Please. afford another golf war you can't afford to merely golf more soon my drone attacks will be their demise if not just smack them with your nobel peace prize <laughs> voters are doubting me no peace inside here i am stuck, stuck in the middle east too yes i am mucking around with no clue when in doubt i'll blame the whole thing on you America. <laughs> you know, I've been having a lot of thought lately. And I, you know, 
get to be my age, you spend a lot of time reminiscing. You reminisce, you reminisce, you think about the past. <laughs> it feels like forever ago I was running for president. You know, there was the, the campaign, the election. I won the electrical college and I became the president. And then years after that, I was running again. And John Kerry was the challenger. And I was the challenged. And I, I think about trying to go through that experience again. I, I, <laughs> I couldn't do it. <laughs> and I think about the people who want to do it, the people who are running for the, the president job in the 2016. And I, I just don't think any of them are worthy, <laughs> except for one. One person who I'm really glad threw his hat in the place where you put the hats. The race is long. With many a thing to learn, with very few first rate candidates. But there's one strong enough to get the win. He is ready. He's my brother. It's all part of my family's belief in no child left behind. You know, all my life people have been telling me, George, Jeb is smarter than you. And I'm seven years older. That's the first time I heard it when I was seven years old. But I, I've had so many good times with the Jeb Meister. You know, there was one time we were hanging out and we were, we were gluing baseball cards into an album. And Jeb says, hey, George, you, know, you really shouldn't eat so much paste. That could be dangerous. And I remember thinking, wow, that's a really intelligent thing for a governor to say. And when Jeb runs, he'll win one thing oh he could try avoiding blame and change his name but if we see a Bush versus Clinton race well, we see a Bush versus Clinton race I think Jeb's odds are better than 50-50 They'd be like, 60-60. Jeb is ready. Just ask my mother. America. A circle that is forming made of television ads. More and more I hear the warnings for conditions I might have. I have countless new disorders that have finally been revealed. I have dry eye, spastic bladder, and that one with Sally Field. I take drugs for every syndrome. I am like a powder keg. When I kick my spouse at bedtime, I claim it's restless leg. When your health is in decline, at least 10 pills come to mind. Lithium I'm taking with a dose of estrogen mixed with Demerol and Prozac. Now I've got hair on my chin. Our son's on Ritalin and Bextra. We thought he had 
DDD. But it turns out that the whole time he is just an SOB. I need Abby and Ernesta to help me sleep all right. Cause Levitra and Cialis keep my husband up. All night, when your life's as bad as mine, at least ten pills come to mind. Lasix, Cruex, Metamucil, Celebrex, and Naprosyn. Then I take a few by Torin, and I wash them down with gin. Now my ears are always ringing. I think Lipitor's to blame. There's no reason that I take it. I just really like the name. I mixed lidocaine with piebalds, and the side effects were queer. Now I'm hearing through my eyeballs. And I'm tasting through my rear. And that giant nose that's Claritin is something I must try. And I take Ginkgo Biloba. But I can't remember why. So I'll quit those pills cold turkey. This was all a big mistake. And I swear that there's no medicine or supplement I'll take. Though lately, I have found when depressed or feeling down, thanks to Botox, I can't frown. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Obamacare. Now, as you know, we were able to reach our target of 7 million enrollees. However, they're still delaying the requirements that all health insurers meet the minimum standards of coverage. So this means that your plan may not cover things such as illness. <laughs> and they will require you to go see doctors that accept slightly lower reimbursements like me. So drink, smoke, run with scissors. We believe if you live a long, long life, that's going to cost us a lot of money. Okay, first patient. Oh, dear. What happened to you? Never complain to the chef at a Benihana. Wow. You don't look like you will be dead soon. And there's trans fling guys that came before you. Ah, take a seat. missing were you born with one hand or two if it's two well that's pre-existing you've got some real explaining to do oh that's just wrong oh octomom so good to see you again so how are things today what's wrong oh too many kids take a few back we won't cover you all we can do is put a cork in you here's the thing we're telling the voters hey you want health care sure we'll give it to you <laughs> a, sh a shark attack we need two weeks notice the cost have grown humongous, but up there in the Congress, they've got a lot of feeling to do. Sucks to be you.
Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We are going to do one more song before we leave you today. Before we do that, I want to thank you guys for bringing us out here today. Hope you had a good time. We enjoyed your company a lot. Thank you very much. For a couple minutes after the show, we'll be out here in the foyer area. We'd love to say hello to each and every one of you on the way out. Uh, we will have for sale our three most recent albums on CD. The newest one entitled Mock the Vote just came out a couple of weeks ago. If you, um, we'll also have some complimentary copies of uh, the lyrics to one of our songs we do as well, if you want to pick that up as well. Hey, check out the Capital Steps website. We are at capitalsteps.com. You can download some of our songs there. Check out our schedule of shows. See if we are coming to your hometown. If you think of it, you can like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter because, well, that's how cool we are, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> now, for this last song, uh, you might not know this, but not long ago, we Capital Steps celebrated our 30th anniversary. We've been in this crazy business for over 30 years. Oh, thank you. Over 30 years now. And uh, what you might not know is that the very first Capital Steps show of all time was entertainment for a Senate office Christmas party. True story, the group wanted to do a traditional nativity play but in the entire Congress couldn't find three wise men or a virgin. <laughs> Since then, like most things born in the Congress, we have spun completely out of control. 30 years been doing this, a lot has happened in this country, and much of it was pretty damn funny. Now, looking back, I'd love to be able to tell you everything we've ever touched on over the years, but there's no way we could do that. Or could we? Ladies and gentlemen, right here on this stage, two intrepid members of the Capitol Steps, Corey and Mike, will attempt to do what no one has ever dared do before, and that is condense 30 years of Capitol Steps material into one three-minute song. Now, these guys are pros, limbering up, getting ready for their big moment. I don't know if this is going to work. For God's sake, don't try this at home, but come along for the ride. Let's see where we go. The first stop, 81, Ronald Reagan, lots of fun. Perestroika, Gorbachev, Lorena Bobbitt sliced it off. Walter Mondale didn't win. Why? There you go again. Top banana in Havana, Castro was in power then. Fawn Hall stuffed cups, Bayer Berry was set up. George Bush throwing up on the Japanese. Al Haig pulled rank, Mike Dukakis in a tank. Dan Quayle, VP, spelled potato with an E. We didn't start satire, but once you see these listed, how could we resist it? Where there's smoke, there's fire. What was just enjoyment became our employment. Pee Wee at a porno flick, OJ Simpson made us sick, and the glove didn't fit. The jury said we must acquit. Clarence Thomas made a joke, something hairy on his coat. Ross Perot bought our hearts with giant ears and homemade charts. Amy Fisher shooting spree, Tanya Harding whacked a knee. Songs about Bob Dole and Saddam Hussein spider hole. Clinton made a big mess. Who thought she would keep the dress? William J. Blown away. What more do we have to say? We didn't start satire. There's no way of knowing where cigars are going. If that cigar's on fire, then while it's still burning, a new song we're learning. Michael Jackson wasn't right. Can't tell if he's black or white. Florida screwed up bad. Left us all with hanging chads. W. Bad review. Someone threw a pair of shoes. Al Gore lost the race, Cheney shot friends in the face. Olympics had the dream team, then the Howard Dean scream. Thurman turned a hundred, mad cows began to rant. John Kerry, Purple Heart, Ude Kuse blown apart. Remember Ted Kennedy? Well, Ted forgot his pants. We didn't start satire, or the Unabomber, or the Octomomber. If someone is a liar, then it's not much time before their name were rhyming. Hans Blix, Bill Frist, mission not accomplished. Senator Barack Obama, black guy, white mama. Rod Blagojevich was there with his Justin Bieber hair. Bob Dole, face slip, sold pills to make you stiff. Tiger Woods, booty calls. Larry Craig, bathroom stalls. Bernie Madoff, Tom DeLay, and Abramoff all go to jail. John McCain takes it alive. Fidel Castro still alive. A governor who looks for tail on the Appalachian Trail. We didn't start the fire, but with each election we got new selections. We would have to retire if they did their jobs right. So we will go on and on. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> On the piano, the one and only Lenny Williams, ladies and gentlemen. 
We are the Capitol Steps. Thank you very much. Good night, y'all. Ladies and gentlemen, please join your colleagues in the foyer for this evening's reception.